Hello. <laughs> wow. I didn't think anybody would be here. <laughs> I thought I'd be on my own. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and good, good afternoon, Chicago. And um, it's nice to be back in Chicago. Um, what do I think of when I think about Chicago? Curtis Mayfield is the first thing I think about when I think about Chicago. But that's another lecture, talk, whatever. Thank you to Tiff. Thank you to uh, Michael for the introduction. Thank you to, to Kate. And thank, it's a great pleasure to be here at the, the Art Institute of Chicago. It's very... <sighs> ah, a little bit. Oh, gosh. Um, The, the, time, the time is out of joint, and something is rotten in the states we inhabit. We can smell it. Our countries are split, our houses are divided, and the fragile web of family and friendship withers under the black sun of big tech. Everything that passed as learning seems to have reached boiling point. We simmer and feel the heat, wondering what can be done. This book, Tragedy, the Greeks and Us. Can you go where the microphone is? Over here. Can you not hear me? Okay. This book. It seems to confront where we are now. There are lots of buried David Bowie references in all my talks, in hands up to where, they, where we are now, by peering carefully through the lens of Greek tragedy. Tragedy presents a world of conflict and troubling emotion, a world where private, and public lives collide and collapse. A world of rage, a world of grief, and a world of war. A world where morality is ambiguous and the powerful humiliate and destroy the powerless. A world where justice always seems to be on both sides and sugar-coated words serve as cover for clandestine operations of violence. A world rather like our own. We have to try and make the ancients live again for our time. Bless you. They hold up a mirror to us where we see all the desolation and delusion of our lives, but also the terrifying beauty and intensity of existence. This is not a time for consolation prizes and the fatuous banalities of the self-help industry and pop philosophy. Philosophy, as it's usually understood, is part of the problem and not part of the solution. By contrast, I argue in this book that if we want to under understand ourselves better, then we have to go back to theater, the stage of our lives. What tragedy allows us to glimpse in its harsh and unforgiving glare is the burning core of our aliveness. Aliveness. If we give ourselves the chance to look at tragedy, we might see further and more clearly. So, thanks. <laughs> shall I stop there or shall I go? <laughs> I get my jacket off a little bit. <sighs> Hi. 
I had a very early start this morning. I'm sure you do too. It's freezing in Chicago, isn't it? <laughs> freezing. Uh, I'm not going to take all my clothes off. I'm just <laughs> making myself more comfortable. Uh, okay. So, let me go on a little bit. So where do we start? So I was thinking about this yesterday, and uh, I want to start with Sophocles. You should be proud. We're st I'm still using the University of Chicago edition, 1951. <laughs> David Green, unsurpassed in my view. These Chicago editions are extraordinary uh, monuments. And um, so I reread uh, yesterday and today what I'd like to talk about for a, a few minutes as a first step so you can understand what I'm up to here. Oedipus the king. Oedipus tyrannos in Greek. Oedipus tyrant. In this unstoppable machine of a play where each line, each word bristles and bubbles with painful irony and ambiguity. The king is exposed as a tyrant and deposed as a monster and a pollution by the very city that made him king in the first place. Impeachment, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> we usually think of tragedy as a misfortune that befalls a person, an accident, a fatal disease, or befalls a, a place, a natural disaster, like a tsunami or a terrorist attack, like 9-11, that's outside one's control. But if tragedy is understood as a misfortune, then this is a significant misunderstanding of tragedy. What the 31, and there are only 31 plays, and one of the arguments of this book is not to read this book, but to read the 31 plays. They're quite short. You could read them all in three and a half weeks, um, particularly the plays of Euripides, which I talk about a lot here. What the 31 Greek tragedies enact over and over again is not a misfortune that's outside our control. Rather, they show the way in which we collude, seemingly unknowingly, with the calamity that befalls us. Tragedy requires some degree of complicity on our part in the disaster that destroys us. It's not a question of the malevolent activity of fate, a prophecy that flows from the inscrutable will of the gods. No, tragedy requires our collusion with that fate. In other words, it requires no small measure of freedom. It's in this way we can understand the tragedy of Oedipus. With merciless irony, the first two syllables of the name Oedipus, bad foot, swollen foot, the first two syllables mean in Greek, I know, oida, and he doesn't seem to know. With merciless irony, we watch someone move from a position of seeming knowledge, more or less his first line when he comes on the stage is, I am Oedipus, whom all men call great. I solve riddles. Now, citizens, what seems to be the problem? I paraphrase a little bit. We go from that to a deeper truth that Oedipus appears to know nothing about. He is a parasite and a perpetrator of incest. Yes, four children with his mother. Um, and the, the way this is usually understood, the way this play is normally understood, this most famous of Greek plays, is a passage from ignorance to knowledge. It's the way Aristotle describes it in the most important 
10,000 words in the history of aesthetics that are called the poetics. But that's not the whole picture. There's a backstory that needs to be recalled. Oedipus turned up at Thebes, the three plays are called the Theban plays, and solved the Sphinx's riddle after refusing to return to what he believed was his native Corinth, because he'd been just been told the prophecy about himself by the oracle, the oracle at Pitho, namely that he would kill his father and have sex with his mother. The point is that Oedipus knew his curse. And of course, it's on the way back from the oracle that he meets an older man who actually looks somewhat like him. In the play itself, another piece of terrifying irony in the play, when he begins to think that maybe he did meet an older man at some point on a crossroads, he says to his wife, in brackets, mother, what did he look like? And she says, actually, he looked a lot like you, but older. Another question, I won't go into this today, in the, in the play is, what does Jocasta, what does the mother want? What is she about? Um, he knew his curse. And on walking along a road, um, he refuses to give way at a crossroads, and he kills an older man and his guards in a fine example of ancient road rage. Now, one might have thought, given the awful news from the oracle, you will kill your father, and given his uncertainty as to the identity of his father, he might have exercised caution before killing an older man who actually looked a lot like him. <laughs> right? You might have thought, oh, to kill my I'm not sure my father is. This is also part of the backstory. He's at a banquet in Corinth, and somebody gets drunk, as the, the Greeks do at banquets, and says to him, drunk, see, you're not, you're not the real son of your parents. They're not your parents. You know that, right? And he just, it begins to work its way in his mind. He doesn't know the identity of his father, ends up killing this man after receiving the news of his curse. So one lesson of tragedy is that we conspire with our fate. That is, fate requires our freedom in order to bring our destiny down upon us. The core contradiction of tragedy is, and this is important, I think, is that we both know and we don't know at the same time, and we're destroyed in the process. And I keep circling around that thought. How can we both know and not know? But these characters and these plays seem to be in that situation. And this is the function of prophecy in tragedy. In the tragedy of Oedipus, we watch someone who believes they possess an unencumbered sense of freedom become undone and destroyed by the force of fate. What is so delicate in Oedipus' experience is that his being is not simply causally determined by necessity. No, fate requires Oedipus's partially conscious complicity in order to bring about its truth. Characters in tragedy are not robots or pre-programmed puppets. In its movement from delusional self-knowledge and the fantasy of an unencumbered freedom to an insight into truth that costs us our eyes, Oedipus tears out his eyes with the brooches of his wife's mother's gown. Tragedy gives voice to an experience of agency, agency which is partial and painful. It shows the limits of our attempted self-sufficiency and what we think of as our autonomy. It shows that we are dependent, weak, vulnerable creatures. 
So tragedy gives voice to the complex relations between freedom and necessity that define our being. It, enact, it enacts the way in which the, the past, if we disavow the past, if we say that the past is no more, I do not live in the past, it's just history, if we do that, the past will creep up and destroy us. Right? Another kind of background reference here is, um, is Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia. Uh, which repeats this line over and over again. Um, as the man says, or as the book says, we might think we're through with the past, but the past isn't through with us. And if we think we're through with the past, the past is going to creep up and tear our faces off, tear our eyes out. In tragedy, and this is a really interesting issue for me, time is out of joint. This is true in Sophocles, it's true in Shakespeare. And the linear conception of time as a flow from the past to the future is thrown into reverse. The past is not past, the future folds back upon itself and the present is shot through with fluxions of past and future that destabilizes it. Time flexes and twists in tragedy. Its script is you and me. Another David Bowie reference. Yeah. Tragedy is the art form of between times, usually between an old world that's passing away and a new world that's coming into being. We might live in such a world now. This is true of Greek tragedy, it's true of Elizabethan tragedy, it's perhaps true of the times that we live in. Our time is very much out of joint. Tragedy has a kind of boomerang structure. A boomerang where the action that we throw out into the world returns to us with a potentially fatal velocity and knocks us over. Oedipus, the solver of riddles, becomes the riddle himself. Sophocles' play shows him engaged in a relentless inquiry into the pollution that is destroying the political order poisoning the wells and producing infant mortality. That's where the play begins. But he is that pollution. And the deeper truth is that Oedipus knew something of this from the get-go. He refuses to see and hear what is said to him. Very early in the play, blind Tiresias is a fascinating character, the prophet, you know, who's neither male nor female. You might remember him from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, old man with wrinkled dugs hovering between two lies. Very much a, a queer figure, Tiresias. Tiresias tells Oedipus to his face that he is the perpetrator of the pollution that he seeks to eradicate. But Oedipus just doesn't hear Tiresias, doesn't hear the words, doesn't refuses to listen. So one way of interpreting this word, the play is called Oedipus Tyrant. One way of interpreting this word tyrant is the tyrant doesn't hear what is said to him as it does not see what is in front of his eyes. Sounds familiar. <laughs> I don't know him. Right? How many times has our current, I don't know him. Don't know that person. But we are tyrants too. We look, but we see nothing. Someone speaks to us, but we hear nothing. And we go on in our endlessly narcissistic self-justification, adding Facebook updates, updates and posting on Instagram. Tragedy is about many things, but it's centrally concerned with the conditions for actually seeing and actually hearing. In making us blind, we might finally achieve insight, unblock our ears, and stop the droning surf of the endless song of ourselves. Me, me, me. This is all for me. <laughs> There's a wonderful expression. 
that's recalled by um, Anne Carson, who in many ways is one of the heroes of this book, the great poet and translator of uh, Greek tragedy. And the expression is, shame lies on the eyelids. Shame lies on the eyelids. The point is that the tyrant experiences no shame. But we also have no shame. We're also shameless little tyrants, especially when it comes to our relations to those we think of as our parents and our children. I think of Walter White from Breaking Bad, who insisted until almost the end of the final episode of that long show, remember this, he did everything, he did everything for his family and not for himself. This is tyranny, this is perversion. Finally, his wife gets him to admit that he also became the meth king of New Mexico, the Heisenberg of the southwestern United States because he enjoyed it. That's at least a start. At least he's acknowledging a desire, a perverse desire. So Greek tragedy provides lessons in shame. When we learn that lesson and finally achieve some insight, as Oedipus does, then it might cost us our sight and we might pluck out our eyes for shame. The political world is full, stuffed over full with sham shame, ham humility, carefully staged, tearful apologies, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, but true shame is something else. I mean, here's what I'm trying to get at in here is, the, is this, this phenomenon of shame. What makes sh shame so interesting is that shame comes over us from outside. Shame falls over us and the eyes go down. Right? I was rereading Milton's Paradise Lost recently. And that's what Milton describes so beautifully in the experience of Adam and Eve and their fall, that when they have sin and death and everything has gone wrong, shame comes over them. Anne Carson again. Um, right. This is the next bit, the last bit. There are three bits. The bit I did with my jacket on, the second bit, <laughs> which is now finished. This is the last bit, which is, we'll be quite sure. <laughs> there will be three bits. Three bits. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> she, Anne Carson says, why does tragedy exist? Because you are full of rage. Why are you full of rage? Because you're full of grief. Right? Why does tragedy exist? Because you're full of rage. Why are you full of rage? Because you're full of grief. This is absolutely right. Antigone rages because she's full of grief for her brother Polynices, who has refused burial rites by the leader of the city, Creon. Clytemnestra rages at Agamemnon because of her grief for her daughter, Iphigenia, who slaughtered, and the words are slaughtered like a young foal, in order to bring about favorable winds in the sails of the ships that are gonna take the ships of the Greeks to Troy for a futile 10-year war. So tragedy is all about rage that flows from grief. But we might add a further question to this. If tragedy is the rage that flows from grief, then why is one full of grief? Because we're full of war and people have been killed. Tragedy might be described as grief-stricken rage that flows from war. We live in a world whose frame is war, and where justice seems to be endlessly divided between claim and counterclaim, right and left, conservative and progressive, 
believer and non-believer, freedom fighter and terrorist, or whatever. Each side believes unswervingly in the rightness of its position and the wrongness, or as is usually said increasingly now, the evil of the enemy. Such a belief legitimates violence, a destructive violence that unleashes counter-violence in return. We seem, we seem to be trapped in cycles of bloody revenge and locked into vicious circles of grief and rage caused by war. Think of Syria as one example. There are many. Such is what seems to pass for international politics in our world. This is where I think, I think, I think, a reflection on Greek tragedy might, at the very least, illuminate our current predicament and tell us something about our present. For some reason, this microphone is rubbing against the bristle of my beard, which is odd. <clears throat> Never heard that before. Because the history of Greek tragedy, which is a short history, it's only the, the oldest play that we have is 472 BC. That's the Persians, where everybody in the play is Persian. I could talk about that. I've got lots to say about that play. The last play is around 402, 401. So it's a 70 year period. And that period is a period of endless war. The Greeks loved fighting, they were really good at it, and they were really good at fighting with each other. When they had a common enemy, the Persians, they united briefly, defied the Persians as they tried to enter Greece, and the Persians retreated. They weren't defeated, but they retreated. And then when that had gone, the, the Greeks fought amongst themselves uh, for the next 30 years in what's called the Peloponnesian Wars between Athens and Sparta, which Athens ends up losing. Sparta imposes a regime in Athens, and then uh, the last play is, I mean, tragedy continues, but we have nothing from after that period. So the, the history of tragedy, the frame of tragedy, is war. And also, it's, this is also, I think, interesting to where we are now and our outer joint times. It's also an art form which is about imperial decline. What's happening in this period is an empire, the Athenian Empire, which invented this extraordinary thing, tragedy, is falling apart. And how does it represent its falling apart on stage in theatre? Greek tragedy, particularly with its obsessive focus on the Trojan War, especially in the delightful excessiveness of the greatest of the three, the big three tragedians for me, Euripides, is largely about combat veterans. But, and this is what's so fascinating, it was also performed by combat veterans. Actors were not flimsy thespians who had majors in performance studies with an abstract interest in social engagement They were soldiers who had seen combat. Aeschylus, the first, some the greatest, not for you, but very important. Aeschylus, on his gravestone, the only thing that was marked was that he participated in the Battle of Marathon. Right? He was a soldier. Tragedy was played before an audience that had either directly participated in war or was indirectly implicated in war. All were traumatized by it, and everyone felt its effects. War was the life of the city, and its pride, as Pericles argues, that war is also the city's fall and undoing. Right? So <clears throat> another thing which is in the book, and I could talk about this a lot more, is that oh, there's this great moment in Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian Wars this extraordinary text where we get Pericles' funeral oration over the dead bodies of Athenian soldiers. And this is where uh, Pericles uh, praises democracy. This is the most important speech on democracy we have in the ancient world. And Thucydides presents it. There we are, Pericles. He was great. 
And then we get a description of the city of Athens during plague. This is around 431 BC. This is the time that just precedes the production of Oedipus the King. Oedipus the King is also takes place in a, in a time of plague, a time of pollution. And this wasn't abstract. This, was, this killed a quarter to a third of the Athenian population. So what Thucydides does is gives us a, 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 a hymn of praise to democracy and a description of pollution and just places them side by side and says to us, kind of, figure it out. This is democracy too. Yet, Greek tragedy is a war story, but it's a war story without a John Wayne figure, without a swaggering individualist who is the sole source of good in a world gone bad. On the contrary, in Greek tragedy, the hero is not the solution to the problem, but the problem itself. The hero is not the solution to the problem, but the problem itself. The hero is the source of the plague that's killing the city. This is one reason why Sophocles' tragedy is called Oedipus the Tyrant. The king is a tyrant who is polluting the city, and the only resolution to the drama is Oedipus's expulsion and exile. This is the great virtue, the the realism of ancient tragedy, as opposed to the idealized violence, empty empathy, and hollow sentimentality of contemporary war fictions. If tragedy is a drama performed by war war veterans before an audience of veterans, then it pictures, it pictures a world without heroes and without tyrannical leaders who delude and goad the people into making war. And so it goes on. Um, But what, how long have I, I can't see, there was something going on, I can't see. How long have I got? Keep going. Keep going, okay. (laughs) In that case, I'll get some water. It's good that you're here. Um, it's not good that I'm here. It'd be better if you were here and you're watching a play and not watching some old duffer talk about plays. Because what interests me in many ways is what happens if you go to the theatre or you go to a movie. It doesn't have to be a theatre. It, it could be a Netflix original series or whatever. <laughs> um, well, not all of them, but some of them. <clears throat> But just think, as we're here in a theatre, just think about that moment. If you, if you go to the theatre, as I do, in, in hope, <laughs> you go in hope, this is going to be really good. And usually you're disappointed because it's crap. <laughs> but sometimes it's really good, and Chicago has a, you know, an embarrassment of, of great theatre, historically. But when the lights go down, um, and you're... No one is looking at you, no one is judging you, no one is telling you what to think. You watch, you watch something happen on stage. You watch people, Oedipus or Antigone, you watch their lives being torn to pieces. And they're not blameless in that. They're often culpable in the, in the tragedy that befalls them. And we look at that, our and, if we, and what interests me in particular about, about theatre is that at that moment <clears throat> when we're watching something and we're engaged by it, we're, we're out there sort of in middle distance. Right? We're not in our heads. We're not, not in our heads, but we're not just in our heads with our opinions and our thoughts and our things that we have to do and our endless checking of our phone and all of our 
uh, that we're, just, we're suspended out there. We're held intelligently out there and we watch something terrible happen. And at that moment, our, our usual moral presumptions about the world are suspended. Right? They're challenged. They're, they're thought through. And um, that's what I want. <laughs> this is an argument for, for theatre in the sense in which that experience of theatre, that experience of observing action, the weirdness of that, and then trying to, um, to take from that the idea that we don't know what we think. We don't know if what we're doing is for the best. We, we stumble bewildered through existence and we know it's going to come to an end. And we know that really bad stuff happens to other people. Uh, and it's not happening to us right now. We're in a theater. We're getting some time off. And the actor gets to go down to that place for us on our behalf. And we get to look and we're saved from engaging with it completely. And there's this other moment. This is where I, I end the book. It's, I mean, what's that about? Um, when I had this, this conversation years ago with, with Anne Carson about, um, about Greek tragedy, and I said something like, you know, I hate catharsis, right? This idea of you go to the theater for a catharsis of your emotions. It's like, it's like a detox, right? It's like a sort of a juice detox. And you leave the theater, oh, okay, well, good. <laughs> It's purgation, it's like a, you know... And it got, anyway, I've got lots of thoughts about catharsis. And she says, I've never understood catharsis, never understood what it means. Um, but what you can do in theatre is you can, if you're lucky for a moment, you can, you can see a burning, something burning, something alive that's burning. And she said it's like walking down a road in Detroit. She used to work close to Detroit. And walking down, I'm sure this didn't happen to her, but it's a story, she's walking down a road in Detroit and you look to your left and you see a foundry. And in that foundry you see molten metal, a glowing molten me metal. And you look at that, that core for a moment and then you return to your walk and you carry on down the street. That's what's going on in theater. And the idea that we can then make sense of this that we can say this is what it means, this is what it's for, this is why it's good for you, is something which has to be resisted in the name of theatre itself. We have to stay with the difficulty and awkwardness of that experience. And this is why philosophy for me has been, is a problem, because philosophy wants to tell you what things mean, you know, um, that you know, philosophy will tell you that, you know, theatre tragedy is like, it's like Guinness. It's good for you, right? It, it's not clear that it, it's something else. It's something, to call it that is to, is to, is to, is to not give it its appropriate dignity and uh, level of importance. So that's what I'm trying to point people towards. Now, power, um, ah, here we go. What's it say? Five minutes. Power, <laughs> he said, leaving the stage quickly. Um, oh, this is good. You'll like this. <laughs> or not. <laughs> There's a play by Aeschylus called Prometheus Bound. Um, Prometheus has been chained to a rock in the Caucasus, different versions of that story, but it's a, it's a pretty awful state to be in. His liver is being pecked out by birds. And um, every day, the same thing. Um, there are two characters at the beginning of that play, Prometheus Bound, who uh, are present. One is called power, Kratos, and the other is called violence, Bia. And power interrogates Prometheus Power personified interrogates Prometheus, what did you do? But violence is mute through, 
throughout the play, says nothing. So what you have in these plays is a mute kind of presence of violence as a background effect, and then operations of power being displayed. <laughs> what, did, what did Prometheus, it's a bit like Life of Brian, what the Romans do for us? What did the Romans do? What did the Greeks do for us? What did Prometheus do for human beings? He gave them two things. He says, I gave them fire. And with fire, they were able to produce technology. And with technology, they were able to produce civilization. Before that, Prometheus says, they were like worms crawling under the ground, human beings. I turned them into human beings, technology. The second thing I gave them was blind hope. And power says, oh, that's cool. Why did you give them blind hope? He says, in order to forestall doom. In order to forestall doom. Um, so, technology and hope. And one of the, one of the things that that tragedy does, that theatre does, is that it leads us to question things like hope and whether hope is something which, audacious as it might be, to quote a resident of this city, um, is delusive and actually serves to disguise operations of power. Uh, the last words of Oedipus the king... Last bit, you'll like this. Oedipus, you know, he's found out. He's killed his father. He's married his mother. He's had four kids with her. They were having a great time. And now he's found out the truth about himself. Uh, she's killed herself, hanged herself. He's taken the brooches from her dress, gouged out his eyes, stumbles back on stage. Um... But he still doesn't really learn. The end of the play, he says um, to Crayon, who's become the leader of the city, uh, my kids, um, my, my kids, the sons, well, the sons are okay. The sons are sons. They'll take care of themselves. Don't worry about them. But the daughters, Ismini and Antigone, I mean, they're a mess. I mean, no one's going to marry them. Think about it. Um, but let's so let them come with me. Or I command you for them to come with me. And Crayon says, almost the last word, here was the last lines of the play. Do not seek to be master in everything. Do not seek to be master in everything. For the things you mastered did not follow you throughout your life. And then the chorus, the last words of the play, say, count no mortal happy till he has passed the final limit of his life secure from pain. Count no mortal happy until he has passed the final limit of his life secure from pain. I don't know whether that sounds pessimistic or optimistic. That's normally what we think of as pessimism. I'm not so sure. Life is difficult. Life rumbles on. It gets, in a way, more complicated the older you get. Distinguishing the living from the dead gets harder and harder as more people you know die. And at any point, something disastrous could happen. And everything that you've built up through your life could be taken away from you in a flash. And all of your happiness, all of your whatever, is gone. So for the Greeks, you can't call anybody happy until they're dead. right? Meaning that... Um, what the Greeks called glory or immortality consisted simply in the stories that could be told about you after your death. So after you died, so what you felt, what, you, what was inside you in a sense is irrelevant. What matters is the quality of the stories that are told about you after your death. And if they're good stories, if you did well, if you got through to the end in one piece, then you'll be remembered gloriously. 
I find that an optimistic thought. I find that a more optimistic, a more realistic thought than, than the alternative. The idea that happiness is some kind of internal state that we can regulate, that we can switch on and off. I'm feeling happy, I'm not feeling happy. It's not up to us. It's for others to decide, right? Retrospectively, we'll see how it turns out. For you, I hope it all turns out well. But you know, as I know, catastrophe is there, right? What happened to Oedipus? Yeah. I hope not. I hope I'm not married to my mother. I hope I didn't kill my father. But some part of you thinks, maybe. <laughs> anyway, that's enough of that. Thank you very much for listening. Whoa. Good afternoon, everybody. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Either myself or Hallie will come to you. Please speak directly into the microphone and pose your question in the form of a question. And also be brief, as I am not being right now. We want to hear from as many of you as possible. Thank you. Thank Hallie's you, Kate. first over there. Uh, thank you. That was amazing. Uh, Where, really enjoyed it. Whereabouts are you? Can you just put your hand? Oh, hi, hi, hi. <laughs> I can't see with the lights here. Yeah. Um, so I'm very interested, as someone who studied the German Romantics and Nietzsche, what you think of uh, their interpretation of the Dionysian. Right. And what, okay. what, if it's an accurate assessment of how the tragedy works. And to me, and you can, of course, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it has to do with how Dionysus is both this primal, violent god, but also a liberator who wants to do away with social uh, conventions and norms that oppress people. And it seems to me, to put it as you, so are, as you are so eloquently doing in our modern political terms, that the more liberal side of things, the the wanting to do away with oppressive social orders often unwittingly and unconsciously works together with a, uh, a sort of reversion to more primal, tribal uh, yeah, desires good. and hatred. That's good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I, I just want to know yeah. what you think. Is that an accurate assessment of... Um, what you think those tragedies are trying to reveal is that often um, this yeah. this instinct for liberation. I got it. I'm sorry. Am I talking too much? I'm, so well, I'm, the, I'm sorry. The, the, I'm, the I'm sorry. Thing is about the interesting thing about the plays is that we don't we don't know what they mean. We don't know what they mean. There's there's 31 of them. There are no uh, there are no tweets. There are no blog posts. There are no reviews in the New York Times. There's nothing. We have no audience reports of anything. We don't even know who was there. Right? Uh, we don't know for sure empirically, there's no empirical evidence that confirms that women were president, present at the, um, the plays. We know that slaves were there. Uh, we know that ambassadors were there, foreigners were there. We think that women were there. They weren't there on stage. Women were being played, right? Characters, there's a whole, I've got a lot of, to say about that. Um, but we don't know what any of it means, which is kind of what um, fascinates me, because this is why, how would I put this? There's, there's, there's a line, I'll get to you, there's a line, um, this is from a classicist called Vilyamovitz, who's famous because he, he, um, he wrote a terrible view of Nietzsche's birth of tragedy and kind of destroyed his academic career, <laughs> which is good because it gave us Nietzsche I mean, you know, you had syphilis and everything, but it was, it meant Nietzsche wrote some great books because he didn't have to do an academic job. And Vilyamovitz, this is in 1907, says, the tradition is dead. The tradition is dead. Our task is to revivify life that has passed away. We know that ghosts cannot speak until they have drunk blood. 
And the spirits which we evoke demand the blood of our hearts. We give it to them gladly. This is a very interesting remark. There is no antiquity out there, right? Uh, antiquity, the archaeological remains, the text, have to be revivified through a blood sacrifice on our part. We have to give something of ourselves to let these ghosts live. Which means that the antiquity that we see is an antiquity that we project onto it, of necessity, always. So the ancient past is always an ancient past in the image or whatever present that we're going through. Which is why it's so important for me. You know, there's a sense in which we live in terribly presentist times, right? We're, we're compelled with what's happening now and what's happening now and the next now. And we're, we, we can maybe think 5, 10, 15 years and there's going to be climate disaster, whatever. We think of these... But the idea of, uh, of slowing down... So th this, this book is an attempt to um, press an emergency break on the present, a break. It's a braking system. And tragedy, and I think art as such, can be a kind of braking system that slows things down and gives us some time to look, right? Some time to look and think and, and to even have pleasure in that looking and thinking. And this is kind of what's denied to us by our continual obsession with the present, with now, what's happening now. And the media, the news media, obviously feed that. And we're all, I'm completely addicted to the news. I'm not saying that. But this gives us a kind of distance. And this is hugely important. But what we see in antiquity is this, what, what, could, be, what could be less relevant to where we are now than antiquity? I mean, who, who cares? Right? Who's got time for that? But my argument is the opposite. That's exactly what we need to do. We have to stretch out where we are open up a space of thinking and seeing and give some blood and let those ghosts revive and speak to us because we might learn something. We might hear something. Um, is the Dionysian account a tragedy right? No, it's wrong. Uh, there are 31 plays and Dionys Dion Dionysus appears in one, the Bacchae of Euripides. There's a lot to say about that. But the idea of the Dionysian in Nietzsche, Nietzsche it's incredibly attractive and seductive, but I don't think it's, um, it's a seduction which needs to be questioned. I could say a lot more about that. I mean, Nietzsche, yeah. Yeah. I have a question for you, right over here. Yep, I'll be sure to brief a... In the last time a, 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 a Oedipedius is basically allegorical that we should not uh, murder our past, or incestorize our past. We just look at the past through, uh, say, uh, objective lenses, whatever era we live in. Mm -hmm. What was the first part again, the allegory? That, that, we, that one of the lessons of Oedipedia is we shouldn't murder our past, pretend it's not there, yeah. or, or incestorize our past. Yeah. But we should look at it through uh, objective lenses, whatever our era is. Yeah. Yeah, if you, you know, if you, you know, if you don't acknowledge the past, you're doomed to repeat it. I mean, that I do. This is, this is a way, so the slowing down mechanism that I'm trying to urge is also, uh, is the cultivation of historical sensibility. Nothing is more important. And to, to make, you know, to make things worse for myself, um, I think the question of the future is the wrong question, right? The question is always a question about the past. And it's with that past, with richer understandings of history, that we have some, some, some arsenal, we have some armaments with which to think through where we are now. And our constant obsession with the short to medium term future, as it were, robs us of that. And that's a real problem, I think. There's a kind of ideology of the future that we are compelled to, because we feel that's what we have to do. No, we stop, we, we look, back, we try and tell a story of our origins, of, of who we are, and what, 
what catastrophic mess we came out of, because we all came out of some catastrophic mess, and we know that deep down. It's a tangled blur back there. And to focus on these stories give us ways of focusing, that, focusing on that by projecting them onto the stories of other people. We can... Our lives are amplified, I think, in, in that way, I hope. All of that could be said in regard to Shakespeare as well. That's another lecture. But yeah, please. This will be our last question. Oh, Good question hello. up here. What was the who wrote the poem that you quoted at the beginning? Which, Your opening yeah. line. That was that was me. It was just me. <laughs> yeah. I thought well, there's a bit. The bit that I wrote, the, the bit that the time is out of the world, that thing, the first, the first minute or two. Yeah, that was, that was me. Uh, the time is out of joint and something is rotten in the, that part, yeah, yeah. This is, you know, those of you who have published things, uh, you know, or look, look forward to that publishing thing, it's always, let's just say, a negotiation, a power struggle. And I wanted this on the back cover of the book and they said no <laughs> this is going to be even more of a commercial disaster than it's been <laughs> it's been a complete commercial disaster people have liked it but it's not so you know and i wanted no puffs on the book no blurbs because you know why you know so what some famous person says great book i mean it's insulting isn't it I mean, just, here's a book, it's up to you. You make, the reader can decide what they want to decide. So I wrote that, but it didn't get on the back of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Okay. Thank you very much.